A wonderful good evening and welcome to a second virtual October meetup. My name is Klaus and together with my three fellow Mob++ organizers, which are Andreas, Lukas and Roland, we are hosting this event tonight. So, of course, due to the announcement, you already know that our event tonight is pretty special. Pretty special indeed. For the very first time, we are hosting an event that involves both the C++ and Rust communities. And the title of the event makes it clear what we try to achieve. We want to learn from each other. Both C++ and Rust are pretty popular and pretty interesting programming languages. And both, of course, have some very clever and powerful ideas and tools, of course, and we would like to uh, like to gain an impression of these ideas and tools. And so this is event about getting a glimpse beyond our current language of choice and a glimpse beyond our own limitations. So for tonight, we have planned the following agenda. We'll first get an impression of our chosen toy problem. We'll simply make an LED blink. And of course, this is a, example is pretty simple, but it can be considered the hell world of embedded programming. Um, and that is definitely a good choice for um, an entry point for both communities, we believe. So after we have an idea about this challenge, we will see the options and alternatives that C++ has to offer to us to solve this problem. Directly after, we'll see the Rust side of it and we'll learn which approach Rust has to offer. Both talks will take approximately 30 minutes, plus, of course, a short Q&A directly afterwards. But that is not all. In the end, we'll have a panel discussion with our two speakers, and both Lucas and me will ask a couple of questions that hopefully um, also represent your uh, questions. And so we'll ask questions about the state of the art of both languages and also, of course, about their future. The two talks and the panel discussion should already ascertain that this will be a very interesting event indeed. And it should enable all of us to get new impressions and to learn something new. However, you can contribute to make this event even better. At any point during your talks or panel discussion, you will be able to ask questions. So please post your questions in the Twitch chat and we will forward them to our main speaker at the end of each of these 30 minute talks. In case there's too many questions, or also very long quick questions that are more like discussions, we might have to defer them to this uh, panel discussion that we have or even to our after talk chat. So if you do post a question, then please write down the slide number. This makes it so much easier to later find the appropriate slide and to talk about this particular detail. And I already mentioned it. In case your question doesn't make it, perhaps because it's just uh, not easily answered, then you do have another opportunity for this question. We'll again host an after talk chat right after the main talks. So at the very end, after the panel discussion, and this will be your opportunity to meet our speakers, ask questions directly, or just meet and interact with other C++ and Rust enthusiasts and chat a little. We'll post a link to this after talk chat, which will be a Zoom event at the very end, or close to the end of the panel discussion, and of course, you're cordially invited to share um, or to join with us in this after talk chat and um, discuss with us, with us the, the two talks. But now, without further delay, allow me to introduce our two speakers for tonight, Lotte Steenbrink and Wouter von Oyen. Lotte is an embedded software engineer working at Ferry Systems who has, transition, who has transitioned from C to C++ and now Rust. In the past, she has worked on industrial IoT applications, networking for constrained devices, and protocol standardization, IETF. While picking up Rust, she's gotten involved in Nerling RS, an open source project on a mission to improve the embedded Rust development experience through better tooling. As a programmer, she appreciates seemingly simple solutions to difficult problems. And as an impatient human, she's fond of tools that support her in building what she needs and don't get in the way otherwise. Voter is a software engineer by profession and a hardware tinkerer by passion. He got his degree in informatics from the Delft University of Technology, and he has worked on embedded systems for industry, space, and military applications. Currently, he teaches at the technical informatics section of the Hocus School Utrecht in Netherlands. His main interest is the borderline between hardware and software. So, Lotte, Voter, a very warm welcome to MoPlus Plus. And thanks to both of you for our for your participation in this event. So I will now give the alert, uh, word to Lotte, who will give us a little bit of an understanding what we'll be doing tonight. 
Thank you. Check, check. Can you hear me? Perfect. Um, then allow me to share my screen. And start sharing. There we go. Yeah. So because we can presume that everyone in the audience is an embedded developer already, we've prepared a tiny little primer before we launch into our actual talks on um, what are embedded systems actually and how do we program them, because that's what we're going to do in two languages tonight. Um, so in the words of my colleague and boss, James Munns, embedded systems are computers you don't sit in front of. That can be anything from little furry toys to industrial robot arms to the key fob um, of your car and also the entertainment and control systems of a plane, for example. And that's a big range of applications and also a big range of safety levels necessary. So that means that there's no one way to design an embedded system, but rather um, it's a spectrum. <laughs> So embedded systems can range from like a tiny bare metal application that really just blinks a few LEDs to um, complicated systems that run on fully blown operating systems like embedded Linux or also real time operating systems that are specialized at um, keeping things safe and um, upholding, uh, for example, real time guarantees. Um, when you're Prototyping your embedded application, especially if you're a hobbyist, you may um, just have a development board. Um, so something like the Arduino at the bottom left here um, that can be manually hooked to external sensors, but maybe it also has already some sensors or actuators like an LED um, um, soldered onto the board that you can use and do things with. Um, and when your embedded application ends up in an actual finished product, it's usually in the form of a custom designed PCB, as you can see on the left, no, on the right. Um, and the development cycle for all of this generally go, looks like this. So you, um, you write your code on your big beefy computer um, on your desktop, and then you compile it for your little embedded target, um, and then flash it onto your embedded device where then the code gets executed and interacts with the world. Um, and what we're what we're what what we're seeing here is um, a microcontroller. <laughs> so we're flashing this on a microcontroller, um, which is what we're gonna talk about a little bit more of the rest of this evening as well. Um, so a microcontroller in general, like you might might know them. These are like the little square ch chips that are illustrated there. If you've ever opened some kind of um, device that has hardware in it, basically, and um, that's the heart of um, basically all of your boards. Um, and it's really an entire computer in one chip. It has a processor, it has some RAM, it has some memory, and also some com communication capabilities to interact with the world. Um, but that's only the brain. And obviously we do still do need um, all the other, or we still need devices and sensors in order to interact um, with the world there. And that's where peripherals come in. So um, peripherals are um, anything that we will attach to this microcontroller that will, it help, will help us of the world. Um, because if we can't sit in front of our little computer and like type in stuff and give instructions that needs to figure out what's going on and react to it appropriately. So peripherals can be anything from, for example, an LED, which is an output device to, for example, a temperature sensor, so, um, which is an input device. So if, for example, we're sensing that the temperature is too high, then we can turn on the LED and so forth. Um, and they're all connected to the microcontroller to, through pins. Um, where current goes goes through and that helps us control um, what these peripherals do and also understand what's going on at the peripherals. Um, and it's the microcontroller's task to really configure and react to them. And how we're doing that exactly is uh, now going to be explain, explained by Wouter. So we'll take it away, Wouter. Okay, after some technical hiccups, I think I'm visible now. Okay, right. There it is. Well, this is me. I lecture at a small uh, section of a technical university in Utrecht, like uh, Klaus said. And I, I like to present C++ as the ideal solution to program embedded systems. And uh, I may make that argument both to the C++ side and to the embedded side. Uh, mostly they both disagree. Uh, now I have the Rust side as an extra who thinks Rust is better. Oh, nice discussions. Okay. So I'm we'll going to blink an LED because that's the hello world example of the embedded world and also 
because that makes it possible to illustrate some abstraction we will need if we want to make uh, more serious embedded programs. Okay, Lotte has already said a bit what a microcontroller is. Uh, I want to point you to the extreme range of sizes of microcontrollers. You can have extra small things for about three cents a piece. Uh, uh, buy it from deep China and you must probably no Chinese uh, to program them. Uh, more standards, let's say eight bit microcontrollers like the AVR8 and an Arduino Uno that I'll show, well, maybe 50 cents and somewhat more uh, capable microcontrollers like they're used in cars, anywhere from one to maybe 10 euros, depending on what the uh, uh, capabilities are. Nowadays, the prices tend to go up very uh, sharp, and I've heard that uh, a lot of uh, automobile companies are shutting down their production lines because of ship shortages. Uh, I never uh, would have expected that. Okay, what, well, how, how does... Uh, uh, a microcontroller interacts with the outside world. Generally, that's done via what is called a GPIO pin, a general purpose input output. That is one of the pins of that chip you see in the upper right corner. And the microcontroller, that is the, the programming running on the microcontroller, can use that pin to read uh, a value from the outside world, let's say a one or a zero, because there's a, a push button attached to it, or it can make the pin high or low when it's an output pin, let's say, to write or to, to blink an LED on it. Okay, in a, the example I'll use the Arduino Uno, that's a, a very cheap microcontroller. The, the microcontroller on it was originally made by Atmo. Atmo is, by the way, now acquired by Microchip. That's a bit like Pepsi buying up Coca-Cola or uh, Apple buying up micro, uh, Microsoft or something. It's, it's a very strange event, but now uh, the both yeah, the, the two big players are in one company. It, it's a small 8-bit chip, uh, runs at 16, me 16 megahertz, um, so it's tiny compared to all desktop systems. Um, you can use uh, a very modern C++ compiler for it if you can find it. It's not in the general distribution, but some uh, uh, guy has made it available with the modern C++ library, so you can do it. There's an onboard LED, it's, uh, that's the one we're going to blink, and it has a USB connection to connect to your desktop or more, uh, laptop system. That's where you develop your program, you compile and build it, and then download it via the USB port. Extremely cheap uh, PCB, you can have it for maybe two or three euros from uh, the, the well-known Chinese distributors. Okay, uh, want to blink that LED. How do we do that? We must look at the circuit diagram of the Arduino, and there we can see that that LED is connected to a certain GPIO pin. And the LED is that uh, thing with uh, two small arrows uh, in the upper red uh, um, band. And that's connected via some green wires to PB5, that is port B, pin 5. Okay, next step. In the datasheet of that chip, the datasheet is maybe uh, 700 pages or something, but only a few pages are relevant here. There are two, what they call registers, in the memory of the chip. And those registers, that there's, they're not CPU registers, they're places in memory that control the hardware. Uh, these two are the port B data register and the port uh, B direction register. And in the uh, blue circle, there is the memory address of that register. And within each register, there are eight bits, and each bit controls one GPO pin. And for our uh, pin port B pin five, we must use the bit 5 of that register. And those registers are simply locations in memory, so we can access them like any, any other thing in memory if we uh, uh, put a variable on the right address. The, uh, no, the, the summarizes there are those two addresses. Uh, the maybe easiest way to uh, access those registers is to take the value cast that to a pointer to an uint8, an 8-bit variable, 
and then use it as a pointer to where we want to uh, uh, manipulate the data. Uh, I think this is strictly speaking undefined behavior in C++, but the, stand, the compilers seem to do the reasonable thing. If you cast that value to a pointer, that value ends up being a pointer and you can use it to address that memory location. But of course, you never made a real variable there, so it's a bit of shaky. But okay, uh, you can see here how I made that those two pointers, DDRB and port B, and now we can use them to blink the LED. Well, for that, we must uh, be able to make the pin high and low. And for that, we must manipulate bit five of that register and manipulating only bit five while well, we can spell out the value that's for it, that's 0, 0, 1, 0, and there and four O's uh, more, but I prefer one shifted left five because it shows the five better. Uh, you can make a bit one by using the OR operator and you can make the uh, force a bit to zero by using the AND operator with the inverse value. And then you use, uh, you read the port value, change that single bit and write the value back. You can do this using a compound assignment. By the way, compound assignment operators to volatile values were deprecated in the recent C++ standards, but that might be ratified because it's a very uh, yeah, useful thing to do. But the, the, the C++ standard committee that made this decision apparently was not aware of the, this very normal use in small embedded systems of it. That's an on, interesting ongoing discussion. So in the uh, part, in the lower part of the screen, to make the uh, that single GPO pin high, read, read the value or it with one bit one and write the value back and to make it low again, you read the value, end it with the value with all bits inversed and then write it back. And now we only need to ask a few things. There must be some delay in between because otherwise we are uh, making the LED blink too fast and then it only appears to be half on. So we must yeah, just spend some time. Here's a, a, a long loop and I must put something inside that loop. Otherwise the optimizer will throw the whole loop out. Uh, looping a very large number of time doing nothing is the same as doing nothing for a clever compiler. So there's an assembler instruction knob inside it to prevent that optimization. And when you combine all those things, we have a, a simple blink program. Uh, in the top is those two pointers. Then uh, the line DDRB is to make the pin an output pin. And then the for loop, the forever for loop is the blinking part. So this is the uh, a blinking with the pointers used uh, to, to directly access the two uh, registers. Uh, this is, of course, not, not a very um, uh, software engineering, uh, uh, well-defined way of programming. In the code, there is literally uh, the port and the pin number we use. We would like to abstract from that. Uh, one step to make it a bit easier is not to use pointers, but to make uh, hashtag defines and to make things that almost look like a variable. If you put the dereferencing inside the macro, then you can just write port B instead of putting an asterisk in front of it. So this looks a little bit better. And this is the style which is mostly used by the header files that you get from the manufacturers. So let's use that. So instead of this port B and DDRB definitions on top, I just included the avrio.h uh, header file that the manufacturer supplies. Next step. Now we go to some abstraction, but we had a, a main loop that does the blinking, but that's not uh, uh, not a good way to do it. Uh, I would want to make a function that does the blinking. Now, how do I tell my function which pins to use? Well, there are uh, four options which I'll uh, show you. One is, well, it seems stupid, but you can just define things global and then the code will use that. Uh, totally ugly, 
but it is often how it's uh, done uh, in, uh, let's say, hobbyist le level code. There's just a file that uses the pins, and if you want to use different pins, well, you uh, change the definitions on top of the file. Easy, isn't it? Okay, we want to do better than that. We can use an identifier, that's a, a value that identifies a certain pin. And here I use a, the C plus enum class, and we pass the pin identifier to the blink function. So it has one parameter, that is the, the pin to use, and then we use a pin mode output and a pin write function to manipulate that pin. And in the main, we can supply the pin and the blink function doesn't know which pin it is. Well, almost as it should be. This is a style used, for instance, in the Arduino wiring library. To implement this, there must be some library code that interprets the pin identification uh, value, and it has a, a big case statement or some arrays that define the, the, the pins and the, uh, the, the bit that belongs to each pin. Uh, the important thing to note here is that this is closed. This code implements the pins, so you cannot... Uh, uh, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, back to where I was. You cannot add more pins to it. This is the code, and if you want to have more pins, you'll have to uh, use different functions. Uh, another way to see it is that this pin blink function does not uh, only get the pin, it also implicitly uses that pin mode output and pin write functions. Those are, in essence, singletons that the blink function grabs, and you cannot uh, make it do something else. For that, uh, we need uh, a form of, your, of object orientation. Here I use an object, I make a pin object, I pass that object to the blink function, and the blink function uses that object to do the things. It, uh, it calls the mode output function of that object, it calls the write function of that object. And now I have full control over what that uh, object is. I can uh, I can mock it, I can make something different, I can make a, a pseudo pin that is not a real pin but logs all the operations. This gives me full control. Of course, this is not done in C like environments, but it is the standard object oriented way to, to do something like this. Uh, the implementation is quite simple. I, I need a, um, a base class that has virtual functions for the mode output and for the write. I must implement that base class for this specific pin. This implementation will be different for another chip. It will be different if I want to do, I want to make a pseudo pin or I want to mock it. But I have full control. I can write what I want in that derived class. And I pass that derived class object to my blink function and it will call the overridden functions. That is not free. What really happens is that the, uh, the object I pass has a virtual function table in it. That is initialized by the concrete class that I derive from the virtual class. And whenever my blinking function wants to invoke one of those functions, it has to grab the vtable pointer. And I use that to access the vtable itself. The vtable contains the pointers to the real functions. It has to select the correct function from that vtable and then pass the arguments to that function. So there is an indirection step in the process. And uh, one unfortunate consequence of that indirection step is that the optimizer cannot see which function is called. So at runtime, uh, this uh, indirection has to happen. And that has uh, both size and speed consequences. This solution is uh, a lot slower than the other ones. Okay, there is one more thing, which um, way to do this, which is uh, a bit tricky. Instead of passing an object to my function, I could make a template function and pass a class to it. it may seem a bit weird. See it as I have a, a, a blink function that I can configure at compile time. At compile time, I pass something to it and it takes the function it needs, the mode output and the write functions, from that class. And this is something that happens purely at compile time. 
so there is no V table, no indirection, no runtime steps involved. It is just a, yeah, a, a static thing. Uh, it does mean that I cannot decide at runtime which pin I will pass. For, for that flexibility, I need the full object oriented, oriented version. But when I know the pin in advance, and well, generally you will, because to change the LED to a different pin, you have to resolder it. That, that doesn't happen easily uh, without your knowledge. So you, you, so you know which pin to pass. You configure the blink, blink pin for that pin. And now all function calls are static and the optimizer can have a field day. And you can merge the, the, the functions together and optimize the machine instructions. This, is, this version is as fast as the, uh, the, 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 the plain C functions, but it has the compile time flexibility. Not to run some flexibility, there's compiled on flexibility. Okay, th those are a few ways. Uh, the implementation uh, uh, that class must have uh, static uh, functions to do those things, to change the, mo the, uh, the mode to output and to write a value. And I make them in line because generally when they are forced to be in lines, they are uh, much easier to optimize. And, uh, well, they must be static because they are associated with the class itself, not with the object. Note that in uh, page up, uh, I don't make an object out of that class. There are no objects here. It's just a class that is passed uh, to, uh, to specialize the blink function. Okay, now let's compare those uh, approaches. The macro approach, uh, the first thing is quick, ugly, it's not extensible. You can uh, and not add pins of your own taste. You're limited to the real hardware pins. It's not runtime flexible. You have to re-edit your source to, uh, to, to use different pins. Uh, danger of dangling references. No, there are no such things in macro uh, country. The second approach, pass an identifier to your Blink functions. Uh, it, it takes some more code size because this, now there's a sort of interpretation of that value that you pass. Uh, the, uh, the write function has to uh, determine which, which pin you used. It needs a lookup table for that. That costs significantly more time, uh, but is, it is as flexible as you can get in C. Is it extensible? Can you add uh, new pins at will? No, because that code that interpreted that pin value is closed. It, it exists somewhere in the library. You cannot extend it. Um, is it zero overhead? No, definitely not. Uh, you can choose at runtime which pin you want to use. You can add one to the pin number and blink a different pin then. The object-oriented version, it is the, uh, takes the, in this example the most code, uh, but it gets better when you want to blink different pins, not just one pin. Uh, it is extensible. You can add your own pin class and make your own interpretation of a pin uh, and have the blink function use that. Uh, definitely not zero overhead, not as fast as the top line. It is flexible at runtime. You could read pin number from a configuration file or get it from the user and then blink that pin. Uh, you have the danger of dangling references. Once you have made that pin object and someone has stored a reference to it, you must make sure that the pin object stays around or you'll have a problem. Then the last approach, the use a class as parameter. It is, uh, well here it's slightly slower than the macro version, but in theory it's just the same, it's, it's very fast. Uh, the syntax is a bit awkward. You, you, of course you have to pass classes instead of objects. Is it used? Uh, no, not much, except by me and guys like Odin Holmes. I, and I've seen the Robot Club Aachen use it. Uh, it is a very uh, um, nice way to do things, but not really uh, uh, accepted or uh, experienced yet. Is it extensible? Yeah, you can make your own uh, classes that implement a different kind of pin. It is zero overhead. It's not runtime flexible and you have no danger of dangling references because there are no objects. There are just classes. Everything is configured at compile time. Okay, that's 
concludes my talk about four different ways to parameterize your blink function. Uh, here all right so water yeah we do have a couple of questions yeah you can imagine nice. that the chat is pretty active more than 150 people there and so uh indeed there is a lot of questions so I i'll just forward a couple of them to you and one of the first questions kind of obvious probably is um a question from cp cp pal um why not use consexpert instead of the macros? Well, that example was uh, how it's done in the C world and often in the Arduino world, but they don't have uh, they don't have C plus plus, and or they don't have C plus plus with constexpert. So yes, you could use uh, constants for those things, uh, but uh, especially when you want to have those pseudo variables, you need a macro. Because the thing is both, uh, it's both the, the casted pointer and the dereferencing of, de of that pointer. In, in C++, how you could make it a reference, and you initialize that to that dereference pointer. That would be more C++ style, but you wouldn't win much over the other approaches then. All right. So then, um, I, I cannot pronounce the name, but um, there was a question about slide 20. Um, uh, th I think this had to do with the virtual uh, function call. So the compiler can work through and realize that it can make a concrete call and not require the vtable if it's all known at compile time. Well, in, uh, yes, it can, and it will generally do that, let's see, slide 20, when you blink only one pin. But when you have, let's say, uh, two different pins and different parts of your program uh, call the blink function with different pins, then it cannot no longer optimize that pin uh, blink function because it must be able to work with different pins. So when you want to use the uh, flexibility of the object oriented approach, uh, yeah, the compiler will no longer be able to optimize it. Where you don't need that flexibility, uh, one of the other approaches might be better. All right, fair, fair, uh, fair answer. Um, then Joank77 asks, um, so um, I, I just read it. It's what I wanted to see, static polymorphism. So he was apparently waiting for that approach. Is there any problem with executable size due to template inlining? Well, of course, if you inline wrong, you, you explode your code size, but if you do it carefully, and this, these functions, uh, making a pin higher, making it low, are typically one instruction, a few machine instructions, and those uh, are smaller than the call overhead, and they might even benefit from being inlined and then optimized with other instructions. So if you do it carefully, uh, the code size shrinks, especially compared to the macro or pin identifier approaches. And it should be, exactly the same as the macro approach because you are essentially doing that all right and then last question which i feel could be indeed a pretty interesting answer can you mix the static and dynamic options in c plus plus so that the, <laughs> I believe the third and fourth approach i've tried to do that but it's very difficult and one of the uh, well <laughs> Disappointing uh, problems I ran into is naming. You, you need two sets of names then for the static and the uh, dynamic version. And I already have enough difficulty to come up with, up with one set of good names. And now I need two. And neither can be the default because in one situation, the dynamic version is more likely to be the default, let's say for screen objects. You often want to be them to be dynamic, but for let's say GPO, the static is more appropriate. One way, what you could do is make a static object that is essentially a kind of switch, which you can configure at runtime to uh, forward its calls to, to one, one of a predefined set of, uh, uh, let's say, pins. Mm -hmm. So that would be a way 
to add some dynamics to the static version. But in general, it's interesting, but I, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So um, I suggest that we continue, that Lotte takes over and shows us the Rust side of this example. Sure. Um, let me share my screen again. Or the slides rather. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm here to talk about the other side of things and that's how to do the same thing, blinking an LED in Rust. Um, I'm so I've already been introduced, so this slide is a little bit uh, moot, but I still want to take the time to make sure to uh, say that um, I barely scratched the surface on C++. Um, so I, I think I, I wrote C++ for less than two years. Um, it's really just, um, but it still has informed kind of the way um, I look at programs and I found myself trying to write C++ and Rust first when I, when I learned Rust and um, there are some interesting pitfalls in there. Um, but what I actually want to talk about is um, the time or <laughs> the, the things I learned since um, I joined a company called Ferris Systems, um, which uh, completely specializes in Rust. So um, these days I am only doing uh, Rust stuff. Um, as already has been mentioned, um, we also have an open source initiative um, that's called Nerling Arrest um, around embedded tooling. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, what I'm here to talk about is to uh, first give you a very, very, very brief introduction into um, the parts of Rust that you need to know about in order for this talk to make sense. Um, this is mainly aimed at people who have either not looked at Rust at all um, or C and C++ developers who maybe dabbled in Rust for like one or two evenings and then you got into a fight with a borrow checker and then you got frustrated and you kind of gave up. Um, and then um, the next thing we'll talk about is um, how to actually blink our LED. And um, the last thing I want to talk to you about is uh, kind of the the work that has been done before us, so that we can that uh, blink the LED that easily and that elegantly. So yeah, without further ado, uh, let me present my extremely grandiose title. As I said, relevant, uh, so welcome to Rust, the relevant parts. And with relevant here, I really just mean relevant to this talk. There is much more to learn about this language. Um, uh, in general, I'm going to need you to extrapolate a little bit and not worry if you don't recognize every keyword that you're going to see. But um, if anything is unclear, um, feel free to ask. Uh, I guess we're too many people to ask while we're looking at the code, but feel free to ask afterwards or in like the Zoom chat at the end. Um, so the first thing uh, is that if we're assigning variables, you can kind of think about that as auto by default. Um, so we don't actually have to write down the type because the compiler will usually be able to figure out the type for us. So if we write down um, book and then um, write the, a, a yellow book emoji um, as a string, then it'll be uh, able to tell that this is a, a string slice. Um, and um, But we can also manually write down um, the type of this. Um, what we can also do is we can take references and they kind of look as you would expect them. You get to use an ampersand and there you go. Um, and also there um, the type will be inferred. Um, another thing that's easy to trip over or that, that you kind of need to switch in your head is that data is immutable, immutable by default. So if we go back to our little um, yellow emoji book, um, we cannot do anything to this book after we've declared it. We can use it, but we cannot mutate it. Um, if we say, well, this is actually a coloring book, then we have to use the mut keyword, which says, uh, which, stands, blah, which stands for mutable. Um, and then we can say this is a coloring book, this can be changed. And the same thing is with references, we have to explicitly make them mutable. So if I get a reference that's not an and mut reference, I am not allowed to change the data that the reference is referring to. And the same thing, it obviously also goes the other way around. If I give a reference away it's, and it's not mutable, I can trust that it's not going to be mutated. Um, 
Then the next thing, um, I really want to give you a speed run, th speed run through, and this is a little bit ambitious, is um, I want to show you the core concept um, that informs API design in Rust, in my opinion. Um, and that's ownership and borrowing. And generally, the principles I'm going to tell you in like the next five minutes, um, you probably know them as, I know I should, it should be doing it like that, but... Um, regardless of the programming language you're using. So a lot of it is really just good form. But in Rust, it's baked into the language design, so you cannot ignore it because the compiler will, will not be happy with it. Um, so yeah, for the rest of this, explain, this explanation, think of data as a physical book. Um, if you own a book, then you decide what happens with it. So if I if I own a book, um, I like to leave little annotations and like notes in the margin because I have the memory of a goldfish. Um, also, if you own a book, you're responsible for its whereabouts. So um, if I have my little book with my notes, I am responsible to not leave it on the train. And I am responsible for borrowing it out to other people or not if I don't want to. And this is where my metaphor is going to stretch a little bit. If you own a book, it dies with you. So let's just assume that all my books are going to go to a landfill if I die um, and um, nobody's going to um, actually take them over. Then um, the second rule is if you borrow someone's book, your access is temporary, obviously. So you can only read or do stuff with the book as long as um, you have the book physically in your hands. Um, or in your possession. And also you follow the rules of the person that you borrowed the book from. So my colleague Anatole hates it when people write in books. I think it's heresy. So when I borrow a book from him, I am not going to take my little pencil and leave anything in the margins because he's going to be angry with me. Um, and the third rule is if you give your book away, then obviously you can't access it anymore because it's gone. And you can never exit it anymore because you haven't borrowed it out. You've given it to someone else and it's not yours anymore. And the second rule is the new owner now makes the rules. So if Anatole gifts me his book and it's mine now, I am free to do whatever with it. I can draw colorful cows in the margins and it's my decision and I can do that. And these are kind of the three sets of rules that you need to remember in order for the rest of my talk to make sense. And another thing, um, a lot of the time, especially when we, sell, when, when, I tell, when we tell this kind of stuff to C or C++ developers in our trainings, they look at this and go, oh great, you have a gar garbage collector, that's gonna be expensive and it's gonna be a pain and we can't use that. It is not. These rules that I just told you are enfor enforced at compile time. Um, so that means we don't have any runtime cost. And also we're catching those rule violations at compile time. So if I'm holding something wrong, I will know because I cannot flash it to my board because it won't compile. Um, and that's exactly the reason I'm telling you this because the compiler won't ac let us accidentally access our LED incorrectly with the code that we, we are about to write or rather look at. Um, and by correct usage or incorrect usage, I don't just mean, oh, you're passing the wrong type to a function. Like, that's obvious. That's going to not compile in C and C++ either. But also the stuff like, first initialize, it, initialize this. Don't forget to do that afterwards. Don't use this twice. That kind of stuff. If you're doing the idiomatic thing and thinking about it a little bit, um, you will get an error at compile time if you try to use the same LED twice, which is, in my opinion, a very nice feature. Um, so yeah, with all of that being said, let's actually finally blink our LED. So in order to do that, I also grabbed some hardware that was just lying around on my desk. Um, if you can see my camera, I'm holding it up right now. Um, this is a Nordic NRF 58, uh, 52840 development kit. Um, just because I had it flying around. And um, as I said in the very beginning of all of these talks, um, it has a ton of peripherals put onto it. So you can see some buttons and um, all kinds of stuff. There's like Wi-Fi transceivers and all, all good stuff. Um, but what we, are, uh, con what we are concentrating on are the four LEDs at the top here. And we're going to make two of them blink. We can also make four of them blink, but that would have just prolonged the code. Um, yeah, and um, 
just to kind of note, um, I am approaching this mainly, as you may have guessed from my, my little intro earlier, I am approaching this from an API, the API design perspective first, and then we will actually dive into the bit flipping parts later. Um, so what we're going to start out is with, um, with our homegrown main.rs, so rs files are Rust code files, um, that kind of blinks the LED and see how we're doing that and how we're using ownership and borrowing to not shoot ourselves in the foot. And then we're going to drill down into two um, abstraction layers that we commonly use in Rust and Meta development um, that are a hardware abstraction layer, which can maybe be the maybe uh, the the kind of equivalent to that would be an SDK delivered by a hardware a, a vendor that helps you kind of um, do stuff with the hardware without having to flip all the bits yourself, and then a peripheral access crate. Um, that in our case is kind of equivalent to what um, Bauter told us about um, where we're actually going in and flipping our bits in some registers. Um, also note that uh, in the following, I will be using the go to def definition feature of my editor quite a lot. So if you see me right clicking and there's a right click dialogue, this is always where we're jumping into another file. So yeah. Um, let me invite you to my editor. Just a, a final quick note, all of the code that I'm going to show you is actually on GitHub, so you can um, follow along as we go or you check it out later. Um, yeah, so this is my editor. Um, I have tried to eliminate all the blinky stuff, um, so you're really just seeing our main.rs file here. Um, and I want to show you what's that all about from the top down. So um, first you're seeing, we're defining that this is a um, embedded program that doesn't use the Rust standard library. And then we're ha we have a bunch of imports um, where we are also importing our hardware abstraction layer that I talked to you about earlier. And we will dive into the details of that later, just letting you know that it's, that it's there. Um, and then what we're doing is we also define an error just for convenience sake. And then this is kind of where it gets interesting. So um, first of all, um, we have an LED struct. Um, so in Rust, we usually start out with the data and then we give the data functionality. So we have this LED struct that represents one single LED. So in the end, we will have four instances of this. But um, each LED, uh, as we've already learned, is controlled by a pin. So our pin LED struct contains a pin value a pin field that um, contains one pin that has been configured as an output pin so that we can actually push current to it and like make the LED go bling. Um, the next uh, kind of piece of data that we're going to look at is our board struct, and that represents the entirety of this huge board, or rather the functionality of it that we're using, which isn't much. Um, and as we can see, it contain contains four LEDs. So this is the LED that we defined here earlier. Um, it's a top left, a top right, a bottom left, and a bottom right LED, and then also a timer just to make blinking more convenient. We could also do the knob thing that um, Bauter did earlier. And what we then said doing is, as I said, we are implementing functionality on the data that we just defined. So we have an impl for our, our LED struct, and um, that has an on and an off function in which we said, um, or this is a little bit counterintuitive, but we set the pin low in order to turn the LED on and set the pin high um, to turn the LED off. And these are functions that um, are part of the hardware abstraction layer, and we will get into what's happening there um, later. Now, just bear with me and know that we are setting um, our pin high and low there in order to turn it off and on. And now, <laughs> Um, we're getting to our implement the same thing where we implement um, functionality for our board. Um, so this is the piece um, where we're actually initializing um, uh, what's happening on the board. So usually um, when you when you start or when you run your code, um, you first need to kind of configure all the things that you want to use in order to be able to use them. And this is what we're doing in our init function. Um, you can kind of ignore this construct and just believe me when I say we are grabbing all the peripherals, so all the kind of sensors and, and all the kind of stuff that's um, that's soldered to our board. We are grabbing them. We are taking ownership of them. Um, and now we have all the peripherals in our hands and are able to configure them. And then what we're doing 
um, is uh, we are again grabbing all the pins that are uh, also all the GPIO pins that are um, attached to our P0 port. And now we have all like uh, we have 31 little pins in our hands. Um, and what what I mean by we're grabbing them or we're taking ownership of them is what I want to show you by jumping by doing our first go to definition call. So we're jumping into this. Um, I'm going to put them side by side so just so you can remember what we were at. So this is where we come from and this is where we were going. Um, you kind of have to trust me that this is a macro call and there's like a little bit more to this but what we're actually seeing here is that um if i hover over this it tells me this is a struct of type pin 000 and then if i hover over this one it tells me it's a struct of pins that type pin 001 and so on so we have for each little pin we have one separate struct that only exists once in this world um, so after we've ex executed this, this line of code, um, we have 31 structs in our hands that represent our 31 pins, and they're ours. We've taken them. Um, so remember what we talked about uh, regarding ownership and borrowing. Um, and now we can make use of that um, by, let me just close this again for readability's sake, um, by defining our four pins. So from our pin struct that we've taken, that we've defined here, um, we are taking pin 13 because we know from the data sheet that this is connected to our top left LED. So we are taking this out. This is um, one struct that we are taking ownership of that's gone afterwards. Um, and that is not to be duplicated. Um, then we're doing a convenience thing where we're just degrading this from this is a P0 pin to this is some random pin just because we can handle it more easily then um, and we're configuring it so we can actually set it to high and low. Um, and that's the point where we have taken ownership of these little, I think of them as tokens. So these four structs, when, we, when we've done the same thing for the other uh, three LEDs as well, and they cannot be taken by anybody else. So if my colleague in a completely other part of the code base say things, oh, that's a great status LED. I'm just going to use pin 15 for that quickly. They can't because I took it already. Um, and then we're also initializing our timer just for uh, easier blinking. And at the end, um, we are creating our board struct. We are putting all of our pins in the right places um, and then we're returning it. And um, yeah. That's kind of the the preparation work that we um, were doing for this. And this is a lot, especially con compared to um, what Walter just pre pre presented. So let me demo to you why we were jumping through all of these hoops. Um, so now we have our main function, um, which is a main function. So that's what's going to be ran when we flash our code onto our board. Um, as I said, we are uh, initializing our board first. So this is um, the, we're calling the beefy function. So this one here, um, we're calling this here um, so that we have access to all the peripherals that we have just defined for our board. Um, and this is where we're actually starting to turn LEDs on and off. So we're taking ownership of um, the top right LED here. We're calling it my LED because I grabbed it and it's mine. And we are actually turning this on. So this is this is a VS code thing. This is not actually a demo of an LED going on. Um, and now, after we've taken ownership of this, remember, if I own a book, nobody else can have it because it's a physical book. It cannot be exist twice in the same ROM. So if I try to do this by um, by defining my second LED. Um, and uh, and and uh, assigning our top right LED to it again, I can, let's see if I, oh, don't spoiler this. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, VS Code doesn't seem prepared for that kind of font size. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If I try to compile this now, so I use cargo build for that. If I try to compile this, I will get a compiler error telling me you can't do that. You already moved it out of the board struct. It doesn't, it, it's not available for you to take anymore, which um, 
is a little bit trivial just for LEDs, but as I said, it's really, really nice when you have a little bit more of a convoluted code base, um, or you also maybe think, ah, I can make sure that I can get away with the crime of reusing this little pin or this little peripheral or using it from two very distinct places because I, I'm pretty sure that I won't get in my colleague's way and then I do and then we get really weird bugs. There's way to get ways to get around this, but you have to explicitly get around it, and that's exactly the point. And what we can also do when we are harnessing ownership and borrowing is, for example, if we say the bottom right LED has to stay on no matter what, and I don't want anyone to accidentally turn it off because they thought it was a good idea. Um, what we can also then do is we can change its state, so putting it in in um, by turning it on. And then we can use the drop function, which kind of throws the LED out of scope, which, as I, uh, as you remember, if I die, my book dies with me, um, which means that the bottom right LED is gone after we drop it, and nobody else can pick it up and turn it off. Um, so this bottom right LED will stay on for the entirety of um, our program run. And... Um, I can demo this to you as well, so um, we can try to turn it off after we've dropped it and um, we can run cargo build again and you will get the same error about um, you can't, it's gone. Now, uh, I want to demo you the actual blinking and what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type cargo run that compiles and flashes my code onto my board. And I hope um, I can then show you the actual board blinking, but I have also added um, a little ASCII, um, a little ASCII illustration. So you see, see that um, it changes and um, it's blinking in our, in our log statements. And if I hold it up to the camera and there is no cable trouble, then you should also be able to see that it's blinking on the board. Yeah. And I also forgot to introduce that this is where we have a loop where we're doing um, the off and on and kind of waiting for a while. Yeah, and that is um, blinking from an API design perspective. Now, if we go back to our slides, um, as I said, um, <clears throat> and as you can, as you probably saw, I made this a little bit more complicated. <laughs> Um, and I think that's a good thing um, because um, we we have, due to the kind of openness of the Rust ecosystem, but also random other thing, a lot of other things that would be another talk, um, we have a whole stack to help us right at our fingertips, um, and it and it helps us to use this in order to create software that is not a nightmare to debug when you're maybe not having your best day at work or you maybe made a really stupid mistake or you have your boss breathing down your neck because the de deadline was yesterday. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about um, what, 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 what kind of happened underneath our nifty little API design. Um, and that is... Um, dipping into our hardware abstraction layer and then finally also dipping uh, finally also flipping bits in by looking at our uh, how our pack does that so we're going back to the code um, and as I promised um, we wanted to look at um, our little set high function and that's here and again we're going to go to definition whoopsie no that's not what I wanted Hey, um, wait a second, let me just find the file I'm looking for because this is the trait and we are looking for line 278. So um, what we are looking for here is Ah, 17. There we go. Um, so if we want to look at how this set low and set high that we just kind of brushed over actually um, works or how it's uh, defined as we're looking into the hardware abstraction layer. So from this path here, you can see that this is not happening in our little um, 
uh, in our little Shine Bright repository, but rather this is a dependency that we call uh, that we pulled in, and that's the NRF HAL dependent dependency, and that defines our set high function that turns our LED off um, in an unsafe block, um, where we then, whoops, let me pull this over, um, where we then actually write. Um, or where we actually set the pin <laughs> um, bit in the outset register um, to, whoops. Why do we, never mind. We set the, 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 the pin bit in the outset register. So um, in our case, if we are doing this on pin 13, then we are changing, changing the bit 13. Um, and that's um, that's that's basically um, the way that you generally write, read, um, or read write to registers in Rust. This looks a little bit confusing in the beginning, and I struggled with this hard when I looked at it the first time because there's closures involved and there's a lot of function calls, and you're just like, just let me shift the damn thing. Um, but the neat thing about this is that. Um, I am using a function from the peripheral access crate as the hover over information tells me. And if outset were, for example, a read only register, um, then the peripheral access crate would not give me a write function. So I would not be able to accidentally try to write some, to something to a register that was just a read because I didn't pay attention and I didn't read the data sheet right. And actually, um, and because if I try to uh, read from it, I would get a compile time error telling me there is no read function for this. And actually, that's something that we ran into like two weeks ago, <laughs> and that saved us a lot of time debugging why the hell this doesn't work. And just um, for complete mistake, let's jump into write um, to see where the actual bit flipping happens, and um, that is in the pack, and that's where we are doing the register set. And if we jump into that, then you can see that we are actually writing to the register. Um, yeah, so as you can see, there is no magic C underneath doing the dirty work for us. This is all Rust. Um, yeah, and all of this is GitHub accessible, standardized, and kind of commu or is community maintained. So if I um, want to write um, some code for, for example, an NRF board, um, I can check out whether there's already a hell in a pack for it. Um, and if it is, then I can just use that and be happy with it and hopefully um, report issues and open pull requests if I run into any problems to give back to the community. And um, those peripheral access crates, they uh, no, those hells are human written, but um, the, uh, the packs, so the ones that stop me from accidentally reading the wrong registers and stuff like that, are actually not. Um, because I think people from the Ada community did this as well, but also Rust developers looked at um, files developed, uh, published by hardware vendors that are actually used to, um, to help with uh, debugger development that describe everything a board can do in an XML file. And they looked at this and went, huh, we can automate that. And they wrote a tool called SVD to Rust that will take these XML files called SVD files, and they will con convert them to such an peripheral access crate for its use. So you don't have to write it. Um, because yeah, you could also just do that manually and we've done that for ages. But as I said, people make mistakes. Sometimes you just don't have your best day at work. Um, it's also duplicate work. I personally find it kind of frustrating to know I'm writing code that exactly has been written by other people as well, um, but we can't share it with each other for a multitude of reasons, and this is actually duplicate work. And finally, it's, it's really not the most fun part about coding, it's just um, copy pasting stuff out. So um, yeah, I think uh, that's a really, really good case for automation. And um, you've probably looked at all of this and went, well, there is a ton of abstractions in there that's probably really expensive, and um, there is, talks uh, and there there are in this slide there's like probably five talks uh, hidden by p uh, to be held by people who are not me um but just to say um rust is looking at this or rather rust does have tooling around this to make stuff less expensive than it looks and my niftiest feature about that are zero size types that are actually just used to check 
um, correctness as compile time and are thrown out at, uh, at after that, um, which is also kind of hiding under the bonnet um, in the code that I just showed you. And obviously also um, compilers can optimize things. And if the language is as clear as possible about what it's actually trying or what you're actually trying to do, that makes it easier to optimize stuff out. Um, and that's it. Oh boy, I think I went over time way too much. I'm so sorry. Um, if we have time for a Q&A, then um, now's the time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and, and don't worry, you did not go over time. Uh, I think oh. that you're perfectly on time. And there <laughs> okay. is definitely time for Q&A. Um, there was a question, but mostly people were chatting about uh, different properties of C++ and Rust. So um, uh, there, there was a very hard phase in the chat. But there was a question indeed. Um, so Lotte, okay. how do you check concurrency issues slash memory issues in Rust? Um, that depends on your definition of memory issues. Concurrency is uh, also a whole other talk. Um, in general, that's also enforced at compile time um, by making sure that you're not, uh, for example, and that also goes back to the ownership and borrowing system, um, by making sure that you are, um, so I, so, Wrapping this up, the sentence up and starting again. I am assuming that by com concurrency issues, you are usually thinking about um, we are contending at the, for resources and we're using them at the, at the same time or in times that we actually shouldn't be using or we're deadlocking and stuff like that. Um, and and that is also enforced by through clever use of the ownership and borrowing system in Rust. Is a very short answer. You could look into the send and sync traits and then see like how that all the, all of that trickles down if you want to go into a Google rabbit, rabbit hole. Yeah, and um, if if the, uh, the the person you ask a question is interested in more, then please see us in the after talk chat. This is the perfect yeah. spot to discuss this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, I'm gonna make a note about um, the memory issues. I'm also assuming that this is um, about memory safety. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, um, from my understanding, is that uh, you usually run into memory safety problems exactly if you violate, also in C and C++, of course, um, uh, the, mem the terminology is, uh, is there differently, but if you generally broadly violate um, ownership and bor borrowing rules, so for example, you have um, several uh, mut mutable access, um, global mutable access to a thing for several times, um, that's very easy. Um, to run into problems there and that also okay this sounds super hand wavy but let's yeah you're completely right let's discuss that later on but that is also um mainly handled by the ownership and borrowing system okay and perfect safety thank you then i think this was two great talks but as i announced before we do have something special plans. <laughs> so we would like to um do a panel discussion with both Water and Latte, and we have a couple of questions prepared, of course. But of course, it's also uh, much more fun if you ask questions in the chat. So please do ask questions. Ask questions to specifically Lotte or specifically Water, but also, of course, questions that perhaps both could answer. Now, yeah, feel free to ask any kind of question. So please do ask questions. Ask questions to specifically Lotte or specifically Water, but also, of course, questions. Okay. <laughs> now I hear myself, there is some kind of I echo, think. so um, somebody has to mute uh, yeah. the stream. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, all of us are visible, perfect. Um, so yeah. I just get started. Yeah. Um, so Lotte, because you just talked about Rust, somebody has to mute. but do you see the strength yeah. of Rust with respect to embedded? Um, for me personally, sorry, Lucas, I muted you because you weren't echoing. Um, for me personally, it's the tooling. And this is not the most technical answer, but I do think just the the turnaround time and like the painlessness with which um, I've been able to develop or I've been able to prototype stuff has been really amazing. So 
um, a few months ago, I forgot my actually this little board in Berlin because I'm traveling between Hamburg and Berlin a lot. And um, I wanted to try something out for which I just really just needed a random board. Um, and I pulled an STM board out of my drawer that I hadn't even unpacked. And within 30 minutes, I had my little hello world running on it. Um, with setup with all. And I think the thing that took me the most was figuring it was finding a mini USB cable for the damn thing. And just being able to do that for me is such a such a such a game changer because I have access to modern modern tooling and like tooling built by people who are used to very ergonomic stuff. All right. Great answer. So uh Walter, where do you see the strength of C with respect to embedded? Well, let me not answer that. But <laughs> answer the previous question. What do I see as the strength of Rust? Ah. Uh, in preparing this talk, uh, uh, that's very funny. Uh, when I get a new board or, or want to do some, something with the board, I start hunting for the correct header files, the correct linker scripts, the correct uh, libraries, whatever. Uh, a lot of just uses Rust car and pull something off that fits. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and that is it's kind of illustrative of the uh, difference between the Rust and the C++ worlds. The Rust world seems to have one common um, uh, uh, place to store and agree on things, while the C++ world oh, clearly doesn't. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> even agree on a build system. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that it's totally a weakness of C++ uh, uh, world, because in the C++ world, there will likely be different header files and different hardware abstraction layers available from different sources. I, yeah. I think the Rust world is more, let's say, concentrated. Uh, that's also more a bit of a monoculture. And the C++ world is a, now it's not a, a D, a B, it, it's a, a hundred, hundred fold culture. And you must always choose for hundreds of options to do a thing. And I think that's uh, that's also in the language. Rust has more of a one correct way to do things. C has at least three correct and add two incorrect ways to do something. Probably more. Okay, other kind. The, the strength <laughs> of the C plus side is uh, that it leans toward C. Uh, you have the, those uh, uh, XML description files. Uh, well, we at C plus always have the C files to. Uh, uh, fall back to. And uh, in that C++ had uh, a very deep heritage in time of uh, systems that are compatible with it. Yeah, okay, I mean, long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that I think that was I, that was an excellent answer, and I do totally agree that this um, this kind of I wouldn't call it a monoculture, but like having uh, usually one idiomatic way to do things and following it um, can be a blessing and a curse. And of course, um, uh, C plus plus does have um, is just looking at a back at a legacy of of just much more development and also much more support from vendors. Um, so that's great. Um, just to put that point out, like those XML files are distributed by vendors, and you like. I also, we are mm, <laughs> not sure if, if it's if it makes or if it's if it's the right thing to say this, but um, Rust obviously is kind of cheating by being able to steal because Rust just started later and some mistakes were made so that Rust didn't have to make them. Um, so uh, this also kind of follows through in like, there aren't as many drivers for everything that I'd like to, but a lot of the times, if you want to write a driver, there's probably going to be a C implementation that you can at least steal implement in inspiration from and also learn from somebody else already made this painful mistake. Um, so. Yeah. Shoulding on the coding on the shoulders of giants, and that's not just in the Rust world. Um, By the way, you mentioned those XML files. I recall a talk from an EMBO meeting where they uh, compared those XML files to the actual data sheets. Mm -hmm. There were discrepancies. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's very funny. laughs> so the, the, I, the manufacturers yeah. actually c contradict themselves. <laughs> yeah, we actually had a discussion around that in our company chat a, a while ago, um, and it turned out that um, these XML fi mail files weren't really maintained as well because they were only used for debuggers, and then people started using them for other things, among other things, SVD to Rust, which prompted the um, the vendors to actually improve the quality of these files because people were finding bugs more often so there's like a little interesting feedback loop there yeah, yeah my friend Odin used the same kind of files to generate his uh, template based systems ah uh, that's interesting <laughs> Does, is that is, is that uh, on github what he's doing um i'm not sure he, he's doing it anymore but it, it was oh. quasier so you should be able to find it somewhere <laughs> All right. somewhere now, since Wotet uh, di didn't want the question, I now ask it to both of you. And also, users in the chat ask this specifically. So, what do you see as the strength of C++? For me? So, well, yeah. total control over what you do can want to do. You can be very clever or very stupid. And you can, uh, can find uh, compilers for all kinds of systems. And uh, it, there's a large, rich history of um, people using and abusing it, finding good and bad ways to do things, and um, well, I'm, I'm not sure it's a strength, but there are also, also a lot of opportunity to uh, do things badly, so you can uh, see where people do that. <laughs> people expose, well, and when people use C++, they will expose uh, whether they are good programmers or not, so you can see that easily. And there's a lot of job opportunities for it. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, when you program C++ uh, 10 years in the future, all your programs from 10 years in the past will still compile and run. That uh, is the same with a little asterisk in Rust as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so I, I there are... the idea that Rust changes a bit more and is less afraid to uh, make breaking backwards changes. No, backwards not. So um, within one edition, you should always be able to compile your code. So if um, if I take code from three years ago, um, I should be able to compile that. Um, yeah. And would you also have linking uh, compatibility with older uh, already compiled code? That's uh, that's uh, the, the binary interface uh, stability. <laughs> <laughs> there is none, and um, that's a that's a mean question, um, or not not a mean question, but maybe that's like a strength of C um, that actually Rust is kind of leaning on and and uh, using that as a hack. So Rust has no stable ABI, um, but if you, for example, want to interact with C or C plus plus, you can kind of uh, you can come you can use um, the C ABI. Um, and uh, that, again, is a thing where you're like, well, we can just be fast and loose with this because other people are being very res responsible, perhaps responsible, but reliable with this. Um, so as I said, it's it's also a little bit of um, a game of cheating and um, stealing good ideas. So I would add one thing here, some one technical thing, and that's, um, so Rust gives you cross uh, version guarantees. So you can use one module that compiles with Rust 2015 and run that uses Rust 2021, and they give you the guarantee that this will always work. Ah. So you have a multi interface layer. I w my understanding is you are able to compile against older versions. Is that Maybe a statement? Check that <laughs> um, I would like to read up on that before I give you give you a haphazard answer. But in general, um, if you are yeah. In general, I think that's 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 not just a compilation. Uh, the answer would not just be around um, just the compiler, but probably also the package uh, manager. And then it gets a little bit more complicated. But I'm like, from what I know, I would also be help hopeful. But I don't want to get myself into a very convoluted answer that then is just more confusing after I attempt it. Okay, so then let's continue with another question. Um, what do you think is the where there's potential for? Where do you see potential for improvements 
in the future for C++ and Rust, respectively. Um, so maybe, uh, Lotte, you want to start? Where do you see improvements uh, for Rust, especially in the embedded context? I mean, the obvious one would be vendor support, but that's not nothing that you uh, like. You as a programmer can influence as, uh, unless you get a really nice job where you can push that forward. Um, but I think that would be the first, like the 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 best way to drive development forward would be to actually go like would or is people going all in. Um, adopting it and then running into, oh, yeah, no, this is still a painful thing. We got to figure out how to do that because that kind of shaves off the, the little pain points. Um, yeah. I mean, we could also talk about like comp compilation times and stuff like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe Walter, what is what's the, on the C side? What would you like seeing improves? Well, first, uh, uh, really who defined freestanding subset. There is work now on the subset of C++ that can conveniently work in, let's say, a microcontroller, a, a kernel, or a, a game engine of our training context, and that basically excludes everything that has to do with dynamic memory. And that also drags standard string, exceptions, etc., with it, and everything that has to do with operating system interface. Uh, that subset is in the process of being defined, but it's a bit painful because, let's say, heap-like allocations are all in all library functions. Uh, the, the current situation is that if you want to use a library function, you have to find out whether it uses the heap or not, or whether it uses uh, an operation system dependent interface. So, a uh, really defined subset that is usable in a standalone version would very much help that. And uh, an essential part of it would be, I think, uh, uh, a fixed maximum size version of the standard containers. Let's say a fixed maximum size string and a fixed maximum size vector. There are those things that exist. There's the embedded standard template library and there are versions from other vendors, but there's no standardized version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, sorry. So maybe a lot of how does Rust uh, tackle this kind of topic of having like a fully blown standard library? Um, well, you, in, in embedded, you are actually not using the standard library. So you have a core and then around that you have a standard library and you are not using the standard library uh, in Rust. There are, or is that what? I'm no, sorry. So looking, that's, <laughs> you, that's a good answer, um, I think. So, um, so maybe but, this but, core, this is a Sorry, the delay on scans. Ah, sorry. <laughs> no, I didn't want to interrupt you. And a lot of things like uh, flexible size containers. Where, where, in which of the two libraries are they? Are they in the core or in the extended? They are in the uh, they are in the standard library. But and this is where it gets really nifty. And um, there are very very smart people um, who uh, kind of, for example, so there's um, how do I start the sentence? Um, if you still want to, for example, have a vector um, uh, because it, it just is more convenient than having an array and stuff like that, um, there is a, he a crate called heap heapless. So a crate is kind of a, a module or an extension that you can easily um, use or pull in um, that gives you uh, gives you a vector whose size you can set at compile or have to set at compile time and then you can use it as you would use a standard vector and that also gives you a heap allocator if you want to and a memory pool and like um, multiple producer multiple consumer queues that you can then safely use across threads and it's like there is so much fancy stuff um it's, sorry uh, yeah, got to make sure that I don't uh, get into kid in candy store mode, but yeah. Uh, Lotte, in the C++ world, there's a big, let's say, distinction be between what is in the standards. Mm. Then Ooh. you still have boost and then <laughs> everything else. How yeah. is it in the world? What you talked about now, is it in the standard or, or is it even a concept of the Rust standard? Or no, is, that is... Is it just an ecosystem? Uh, Heapless is really just like a library that you would uh, that you would um, call in um, that that you would that you would integrate and link to um, as as you would like with I don't know I my vendors uh, 
I don't know, but a modern library or something like that. Um, in general, um, in general, Rust, the language does have a standardization process as well, but it moves in different cycles. So it moves in six week cycles rather than in what was it, three or four year cycles. Um, but that kind of stuff is not always like the that kind of stuff isn't really targeted at as being ever part of the language. And it's rather like pull in this extension if you want to um, use a different one if you don't like nobody's nobody's prescribing you to do this and you don't have to use heatless you can just um use like bare like naked arrays as you as you would maybe just in random and like in, in regular c it's really just a convenience thing and also somebody already wrote the hard parts so you don't have to and um probably also people ran into very painful bugs so you don't have to part um, also, one thing, just because you noticed, uh, you you noted this voucher um, or kind of subsets of the language. I think one thing that would move um, Rust in embedded much uh, forward would be to qualify Rust for more safety critical applications, um, because embedded is moving more and more. Or what what, what do I mean? No, not moving, but there is a lot of um, applications for embedded um, software that are just that could potentially kill people um, and that um, you can't usually uh, can't use Rust for yet. Um, there is Ferrocene um, working on that, but um, yeah, that's a huge field of embed embedded software and that um, being part of that would help Rust and I think also would help the field. All right, then perhaps one last question. Probably also bigger discussion. Um, how easy is it to embed perhaps Rust in C++ or Rust uh, C++ in Rust? Is there any any examples? What is your experiences, impressions, etc.? I am gonna assume that this question is targeted at me. <laughs> okay, so Roger is shaking his head. Um, <laughs> no I experience. Mean, <laughs> um, no experience. Yeah, I mean the. The the kind of big and famous example is obviously um, Firefox and like Mozilla um, integrating it. But um, yeah, that is absolutely doable. As I said, um, Rust is kind of a Rust. Uh, you can compile a Rust library so that it looks like a gen like a normal C library to a C um, program. And the same, I think, is possible for C++. Um, so what you can, for example, do is if you know, and we've um, made good experiences this with, with clients uh, with this as well, um, is if you know, oh, I have this one little part of my software that's um, that I'm, I'm really struggling, for example, to get um, get the the memory safety right, or we're really struggling to, with a parsing or stuff like that. That's where you can plonk in or rewrite that part in Rust and kind of plonk, plonk it in as a library, but don't have to like rewrite your whole system in Rust because that would be bonkers and absolutely unrealistic. Um, yeah. And you can do the can do the calling in both sides. So in we can meet in the middle, and the playground is C. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and that's actually that's actually like um, if you want a little um, if you want a little uh, practice example from practice, that's actually um, something that we were really able to harness because we were um, with a client. We um, they they had. Um, what they were doing is they were having embedded systems that needed that were really bare metal that also needed to talk to um, some embedded Linux and then also needed to talk to like some uh, Python scripts on like different kinds of computers or like big big operating systems um, and they had like some cobbled together um, just like they put their packed structs into a packet and like sent that off. And that is very painful to manage and parse, um, especially across compiler versions and then with Python involved and stuff. And that's where we went in and plonked in um, a Rust uh, implementation of that because Rust has like a really nice serialization and deserialization library and it's actually pretty fast there. Um, and the reason we made this, we were able to make this interoperate over all of these platforms and also with Python script and stuff is because Python is able to talk to C. So we're disguising as a C library. So there you go, integration. Um, and again, that's kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. 
Okay, thanks um, for the answer. Um, yeah. Maybe to round this off, I would like I would like to ask both of you what's something you learned by participating in this event. By, what did, what's something you're going to take home? Harry Walter, do you want to start? I find the ID in, in the rust of ownership very interesting. I, I don't have an equivalent uh, uh, concept in C++ that is checked at compile time. I, th I think that's a very interesting idea. I just think of objects as available everywhere and not as something that is uh, yeah, compile time ownership past. I, I think that will give me food for thought for a few years or so. And maybe C++ will incorporate that concept once. Uh, in fact, I'm sure it will uh, in some convoluted way and with a few other things besides and uh, in, in due time. But I think that's a very interesting concept that I uh, learned. Yeah, um, I mainly grew curious about um, Wouter's uh, a templating solution to bl making an LED blink. It took me a few passes to figure out what was going on. Um, I think you held some more talks about this approach, right? So I'm going to uh, look these up and um, learn more about that. I'm also really looking forward to the um, kind of broader discussion later and see um, what um, we can take away from there. Right, which is a very, very nice pitch to the final thing that you can do this evening. So first of all, um, thank you very much, uh, very, thank you very much to both you, uh, Lotte and Walter. Um, this was really great. Thanks for the talks and also the panel discussion. And now uh, to everybody, if you do want to continue this discuss this discussion, if you want to ask direct questions to either of our speakers, then please feel free to join us in our after talk chat. I've just posted a link to this uh, Zoom meeting in the chat. So please feel free to just join us. And well, else, if you don't have the time or don't want to, have a great evening. And thanks for joining us tonight. Perhaps see you next time.